样。Broadcasting live from deep within the borders of occupied liberal territory known as California, Luca Zana with love, guns, and freedom. All systems go. Don't tread on us. We're not afraid. You work for us. We're not your slaves. Don't tread on us. Hi folks, this is Luca Zanna and you're listening to Love, Guns and Freedom. I'm very excited today, more than ever. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you, uh, I'm an American, not by birth, but by choice. And more important, I realize the importance of the concept of state citizen. Uh, I am an Arizona citizen. And I'm proud to be that. Uh, today I have a guest that I've been studying about him before even I was an American citizen. And I know that's not something you would like to hear. But, you know, at the time when I was still not knowledgeable about much of information I know today, I thought that was the right thing. But I'm proud to be here in this country called America, to believe in the Bill of Rights and Constitution. And uh, also I'm proud to have known in person especially after reading his books, the guest of today, today's guest. His name is Michael Badnerik, and uh, I will tell you a little bit about him. It's right now ready to go in. He's on the phone, and uh, we will ask him. I will have him for, with him um, two hours, for all two hours, because I have so much information. And uh, this is not just about talking about things that may be entertaining. It's about how to understand how to regain our rights how to try to stop this tyranny and uh, you will see maybe you you may not like the answers but i think it's very enlightening and uh, it will make you think a lot so now before we start with the guest i would like to just to remind our sponsors because differently from the government we do not steal from you we do not uh, come with a gun point at your face but we ask we believe in free market and we like we we really appreciate your support so what I would like to say, first of all, I would like to thank our two sponsors for today. We have MP Gun Sales in Fort Mojave. If you need a gun, if you need a, even just an advice, you know what I like about these guys, they're very knowledgeable, okay? So you go there, ask them. They are great. It's, uh, they are located in 4470 Highway, uh, excuse me, 4470 Highway 95 across from Maverick in Fort Mojave. You can go to the website, mpguns.com, or you can also call them, 444 5905. Then we have also another great sponsor, is a friend of mine, Tom Sanford and his wife, um, another guy that believes in freedom, believe it or not, another terrorist, great guy. I love his business and he had a great, great idea a few years ago. He thought about this, uh, you know, smokeless cigarette and cigars. And uh, guess what? He, he, he's making it. He has a great business called the Colorado River Vapor. And uh, it's just to let you know, you can go find them also on Facebook. Also, if you go to lovegansfreedom.com, I also have a link. You can see them directly, go to, your, to his site. And uh, please go visit them. It's worth it. And they have also a great place they, they can do. You can do live music, listen and play music. And this is the cigar he gave me, if you can watch it on YouTube or on the webcam. They are smokeless cigars. Great idea. So thank you for the sponsors. Now... Let me put, first of all, on the air our guest. One second only, okay? Michael, are you still there? Hello, Michael? Okay, we had Michael on the air. Michael, are you there? Michael? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. How are you, Michael? I'm very well, thank you. Very good, Michael. Lista, I want to thank you, first of all, for coming here on the air with us. 
And uh, more important, I want to thank, you know, this is coming from a man that wasn't born in this country, but I always idealize America. And uh, was in America that unfortunately, when I came, I was already a little late for some areas, but you, may, you gave me hope. You gave me hope to have a chance to understand, first of all, the principle upon this country was founded, and more important also to understand that I wasn't alone. Even I was born in Italy, but I wanted to be part of this, uh, to be a free man. And uh, I found in you that you, you set for me a great example. So I want to thank you again. Thank you for being here and for what you're doing. Well, thank you for having me on. And I think that being on your program demonstrates that it's the matter of principle, that, you know, freedom and love and and all of these human emotions are universal, uh, whether you were born in the United States, whether you were born in Italy. And, you know, I'm just very, very proud to know that you followed the principles and came to the United States. And, you know, even though, you know, English may not even be your first language, you are very passionate about the same things that I am passionate about. And I'm very proud to, uh, to be on your program and to, to work with you towards our mutual liberty. Thank you. I would like to introduce you a little bit. You know, probably many people of the li many listeners already know about you, especially people that they understand freedom and liberty. But you know, I would like to give you a, what you, a, 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 an introduction that you well deserve. First of all, Michael Baldinarik is an author. He wrote a book, and I have today with me two great books. One is The Secret to Sovereignty, and the other one is Good to Be King. And uh, I want to thank you again for the secret to sovereignty that I received as a gift just f uh, Friday, and I'm reading it through. So it's a great author, and I really uh, appreciate it. People can go there and find out how to get these books, and I will tell you later how to do it. Then the results is a constitutional scholar. Okay, is a scholar. It means uh, is, is the guy has been studying the constitution for years, and he does incredible classes. I also, I have here as information that you are a software engineer a political figure, a uh, former radio talk show host, and also he was the Libertarian Party nominee for President of the United States in 2004. So it's, uh, it's really a man with multi-talents that is dedicating and he dedicated most of his life and is not just somebody that is doing it as an abstract concept. As you will see when uh, we will talk through this book, the man, what I really sometimes I find fascinating, is doing it in his own first person. So he's not just talking, he's also walking the walk. So that's uh, pretty much I would like to say to the audience. Now, Michael, can you please uh, finish to introduce yourself? I'm sure there's uh, some other things I may have probably forgotten or you would like to add. Go ahead. Um, I've just been following the course of liberty all of my life. I was a Boy Scout for 12 years, and I would carry the flag in the parade every 4th of July, Veterans Day, whatever the parade was, I was there. And I remember being so proud that I was an American, that I was able to, to carry the flag. And then unfortunately, as I grew older, I began to realize that my government was not the beacon of liberty, that they were not good people. And, and I was very, very disappointed. Um, I started to study the, the IRS, the uh, 16th Amendment, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and I quickly, very quickly came to the realization that most of what my government does is unconstitutional. And, and that's disturbing. I mean, it really shook me to my core. And... I was convinced at the beginning that that could not possibly be true, that, you know, I must have missed something in the translation, that somewhere there was a document that would explain it and make everything better. And as I continued to study, I became more and more convinced that literally most of what my government does is unconstitutional. And I find that unconscionable, totally unacceptable, and I have dedicated myself to restoring 
a constitutional republic, at least here in the United States, so that people can do the work that they want to do. They could live peacefully with their neighbors without government inter- intrusion into their lives. And that, once again, if we are able to set a good enough example, that that spirit of freedom can be transmitted around the world. And I, I do not mean that the United States should actively be exporting democracy. We've got our military in over 130 countries around the world, and most of the people in the United States think that we're doing such a good job, we're bringing freedom and peace to so many other countries, when that's not true at all. Exactly. Uh, We are intervening in their government. We're, you know, meddling with their economy politically. We are poking these people in the eye with a sharp stick. And then we're surprised when other countries are not happy with the United States. Exactly, Michael. And, you know, unfortunately, I think it's part of this, uh, all, whatever we're doing now, whatever it's happening, it's been planned a long time ago. And part of that was the completely um, brainwashing the masses at different level, and more important, exactly, almost uh, separating them from the cons to know the truth about the Constitution. And it's not just about a little booklet that, uh, you know, they put somewhere on the desk. Unfortunately, it must be lived and must be understood. And only then people must decide if they want to, you know, whatever they see now, they agree with that. And that means at that point they don't support the Constitution. At that point, we have it clear. Otherwise, all the people that they're going around today and they think that the Constitution is our law of the land, and then they realize that all everything the government is doing is completely opposite of that. They need to first learn this document. That's why one thing I found about you was, um, before even I was a citizen, it was around 2004, I was trying to do some learning about the Constitution because, you know, the government gave me, the federal government, this sort of a little booklet and uh, questions and answers. I found it very stupid and very demeaning. So I wanted to try to learn more on my own. And I stumbled one of your videos, okay? It was about the constitutional class. That, by the way, you have also on your website, uh, constitutionpreservation.org. After I watch just the first hour of your first uh, part of your seminar that you do around the world, around the, uh, America, I say, oh my God, how much we're not being told, how much we're not being, you know, sh- almost, you know, of course, it's our responsibility to learn, but at the same time, you realize how much difference is what they're trying to tell us we should learn. So that's the problem. Sometimes, we, as you say, we cannot defend our rights if we don't know that we have rights, correct? Oh, absolutely correct. So education is the first thing. That's why, for me, the purpose of this show, this show, it is not to entertain. I'm not that good. And on top, you know, as you know, I have limitations with my English still, even it's supposed to be my first language since I gave up my Italian citizenship. But I realize that my only goal here is try to reach my fellow Americans, my, rel- my fellow humans that believe in freedom and to try to share as much information as, we, as, as I can. Now I have a bigger audience through the radio. Because the point is, what we have stake here, it is not just an abstract concept of freedom. This is happening right now in our lives. Right now, it's really accelerating. And we can see that all the things that you have been telling the last 20 years, 30 years, and some other people before you, there were things that were going to happen. Now they're happening. This is that now, we are living like right now, already in 1994. I mean, you see what's going on better than everybody else. Please tell me a little bit, first of all, what do you think? I know what you answer, but I would like to remind to the, to, the, to the audience, what is the function of the government, Michael Batnarik? Well, the, the only legitimate function of our government is to protect the life, liberty, and private property of its citizens. Uh, it's an important task, but it's relatively limited. And I think it makes logical sense that the government cannot protect your property simply by taking it away from you. And most people have little or no idea what the Constitution says. And what I try to do in the first few minutes of my class is to just rattle their cage, to convince them or allow them to convince themselves 
that they don't know what the Constitution says. And um, once you've dropped the premise that, you know, the American government is good and wonderful and, and doing all these terrific things for people, then you start to look for the truth. Um, if you're not even looking for the answer, it's a guarantee that you won't find it. Exactly. Exactly. It's true. And, you know, I just realized one thing also that uh, people's apathy is the fertile ground for government corruption. And we've been almost uh, pushed to be apathetic, especially the last few generations. And uh, we don't get involved. We don't want to know. If no, I mean, there is a phrase that I really find pretty much the sum up for me all your book, at least uh, if I had to just get one word out of the book I'm reading, Secret to Sovereignty by Michael Batnarik. Stand up for your rights. Nobody is going to give them to you. That's for me the most important thing. You know, there, as you say, there is not uh, the perfect answer. Everybody must find their answer how to get our sovereignty back. But for sure, if not every one of us does not stand up for our rights, nobody's going to do it for us. Correct, Mike? Oh, that is absolutely correct. And it is perhaps the most important concept in the book. The problem is that when you whittle it down to a sentence like that, people go, well, that was just too simple. They don't understand all of the principles behind that idea, and it's very easy for them to just kind of ignore the, the obvious or what, what you and I might feel was obvious. And that's where, I, excuse me. No problem. That that's where I really want to let people know that nothing is obvious. I mean, it is obvious to you and I that two plus two is equal to four. I mean, that, that's a cliche already. But if I have a two-year-old who walks into the room and I hold out a handful of pennies. Is it obvious to the two-year-old that two plus two is equal to four? No, a two-year-old actually has to count. You know, they have to hold out their finger and point to the pennies one at a time. They, they have to figure it out because it's not obvious. And a lot of the principles that most of us kind of take for granted are not obvious. And we take the... We develop a conclusion, and we focus on the conclusion rather than the principles that underlie that uh, conclusion. Exactly. I've been researching a little bit about um, your phrases. I mean, you have a lot of interesting phrases that you wrote in the course of the years, and I tried to elaborate questions after reading some of your phrases. I have one phrase that uh, you can confirm if it's yours, of course. Let me know. Uh, you uh, said, communities don't have rights. Only individuals in the community have rights. Is that your phrase, first of all? It is my phrase. Perfect. And uh, the question is, because sometimes, as you said, two years old kid, you must tell them before they can elaborate. We need to remind people the difference between a right and a privilege. And I like so much the way you do it in the, your first hour of your seminar that you can find online at your website, constitutionpreservation.org. Can you please remind us what is the difference between a right and a privilege? Well, quite simply, a right is something that you can do without anybody else's permission. Um, if I ask your audience, or if I tell your audience that they are not allowed to think about a black cat, that during our program, you know, anyone caught, you know, thinking about a black cat is required to turn off the radio. Well, that's a ludicrous statement. It's impossible for either you and I to enforce that idea. And people can think whatever they want. The, the opposite of a right is a privilege. A privilege is something that someone of a higher authority allows you to do. You get a driver's license. You get a concealed carry permit. These are indications that the government is allowing you to do something. Well, okay, if a license demonstrates permission, 
my question to your audience is then, if you have a marriage license, mm -hmm. what do you have permission to do now that you didn't have permission to do before? I agree completely. You know, who gave you that permission, and where did they obtain the authority to give you permission in the first place? Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I really went after, I started, you know, you made me think a lot, and that's, I like that, because, you know, at the beginning, it shocked me a little bit. I was not even a citizen. Then when I started to understand the concept, privilege, right, ownership, freedom, and then I said, wait a second, I am here on my own property, or what's supposed to be my property. And uh, just to let you know, guys, I know you're calling. Please, for the second hours, we will accept calls. If you can just hold it, okay? And uh, I would like first to go through so much information. Anyway, so when I learned about the idea of uh, property, and more important, permit, if it's really mine, I shouldn't ask permission to anybody. And uh, especially when, you know, there is no reason for you know, to infringe on anybody else's rights. For example, let's say I'm, I'm living on uh, 40 acres, okay, and there is nobody around me, and nobody can be um, in danger of my buildings, or if I want to do some sort of, uh, let's say, unpermitted building, it's my head, my money, the house is paid, the land is paid, why should I ask for a permit? I mean, I've been trying to talk about this concept to supervisors in our county, and some of them, they uh, philosophically, they understand, but... Now we need to start to go more than understanding. I think we should get it back the way it's supposed to be. What do you think about this uh, property right permit crap that we've been brainwashed all these years? Well, I dislike the idea of the government giving me permission for anything. Mm -hmm. I'm an adult, and I am currently uh, living with my parents, taking care of them, you know, as they they need help in their older years. But I don't ask them for permission. I mean, I love my parents, but they don't tell me what I can or cannot do. If I won't let my parents tell me what to do, why, why would I allow the government to tell me what to do? Exactly, exactly. And this is, you know, I read your book, at least I'm reading through your book because I would like to really, really carefully I'm going through. There are so many other aspects of your life more than just uh, uh, building permit. Now everything is a permit, you know, uh, driver license and uh, concealed carry permit. And I mean, I think almost everything we are doing, they want a permit. I know one thing that I really was, um, made me think a lot when you explained the 14 Amendment, you know, and exactly what happened according to your, you know, constitutional scholar opinion what the, why is so important and so dangerous this 14th amendment to us as a citizen of these united states of america well this is going to shock some of your readers they're going to find it difficult to accept with a brief explanation however we the people ordain and establish the constitution we the people invented congress if we the people invented Congress, then who works for who? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the obvious answer, or at least the answer that it's easy to, to come to, is that the government works for us. There is a maxim of law that predates the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was signed in 1215. Mm -hmm. And that maxim of law is that the creator always has more power than the created. So if I, have, if I build a house, that's wonderful, uh, but I also have the ability to take that house down if I realize later that the house was blocking my view or that the house was struck, whatever my reason. So if we, the people, invented Congress, because the people were here long before Congress existed, Congress is a concept of our imagination. We dreamed it up, and we said, okay, there is going to be a Congress. So if we invent Congress, then they work for us, not the other way around. In 1868, uh, shortly after the War of Northern Aggression, the Congress 
you know, basically came up with the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And within the 14th Amendment, Congress invented a legal status called United States citizen. So if Congress invents a United States citizen, then who has more power, Congress or a United States citizen? Exactly. Well, I'll, based on our logic, if Congress has invented this United States citizen status, then Congress has more power. And the 14th Amendment says so explicitly. It says all those born or naturalized in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction. If you are subject to something, mm -hmm. then you are subordinate to it. You are obligated to follow all of those rules. And I will tell you and your audience right now, I am not subject to Congress. I understand. Congress does not get to tell me what I can say or where I can say it. Congress does not get to determine whether or not I carry a gun to defend myself. Congress does not get to tell me anything. They work for me. I completely agree with you. The problem is that many times, you know, especially now with the, what I'm really fearing for this country, that is all being uh, planned a long time ago, and they try to brainwash the masses. They have a big media of, uh, I mean, instrument of mass destruction and distraction. It's called television. And, of course, the school system is a re-education uh, public school, I call it. Uh, they try to create a new class of drones, of uh, people that are semi-humans, because they don't really understand what's going on. And I'm not trying to be offensive. It's the reality. I mean, we look now at some uh, type of uh, humanity off the streets. They don't even know who is the president. They don't even know how to tie their shoes. I mean, seriously, and these people can't vote. And since uh, they've been brainwashing us, or at least the last four presidents, that we are a democracy, and uh, the most dangerous word I think our founding fathers ever wanted to touch, never be mentioned in our Constitution and Bill of Rights, and, of course, Declaration of Independence. Now they can use the force of the mob, or the majority, to try, and I remind the word try, because I like your explanation, you can vote all you want when you want to come and get my guns. Still, somebody needs to come and get it for me, and I completely support that philosophy. So I would like to remind, because it's something that we know, most of the audience knows the difference, but we are trying to reach people that maybe they still try to think a little bit. Michael Badnarik, please, can you explain in your own words the difference between republic, constitutional republic, and a democracy, and why democracy is so dangerous to freedom? Well, in a democracy... You can vote on anything. If I decide that red is my favorite color, and, well, gosh, I think that your living room should be painted red, we can take a vote. We can have all of your uh, listening audience call in or send us an email, and we can take a vote. And if I can persuade your listening audience to vote for red, then presumably we can show up with paintbrushes and rollers And, and paint your living room red. Well, that might be a nice sequence of events, but it's completely without legitimacy because it is your house, you own the property, and therefore only your vote counts. You know, you get to paint your living room whatever color you want it to be. The rest of us have no vested interest in the color of your uh, living room. So when we talk about democracy, we talk about majority wins. Well, if the majority wins, then necessarily the minority must lose. In a republic, there are certain things that you cannot vote on. You cannot vote on my choice of religion. You cannot vote on my freedom of speech. You cannot vote on what kind of a gun I carry or where I carry it or whether I'm allowed to defend myself on a city street. Those things are not a valid basis for your vote. And so I speak at college universities uh, very frequently, and 
every university in the United States is left-leaning. They, they try to be progressive. Um, I spoke to a, a group of students in Rhode Island, and the university was so left-leaning, I was afraid to put my bottle of water on the floor <laughs> for fear that it would roll to the wall. Oh, my gosh. And so I spoke to them, and the very first question was from a young lady. I'm sure she was uh, very sincere, but she also thought that she was able to paint me into a corner. And her question was, you know, Mr. Batnark, don't you think guns are dangerous? My answer was, no, ma'am, I don't think guns are dangerous. If I did think guns were dangerous, I wouldn't have a closet full of them. And then she got very, very smug because she thought that she had, you know, tricked me into this political corner. And she goes, well, couldn't we vote to take your guns away? And I said, well, yes, ma'am, you could vote. You could have a unanimous vote that, you know, Michael is crazy and dangerous and you can vote to take my guns away, but then you have to have another vote to determine who is going to come and take those guns. And that's not a vote that I recommend that you win. And I was amused as their eyes would open up really wide. They, <laughs> they realized the implication of my statements. It was like watching, you know, gophers pop up out of a, you know, a hole out in the, the prairie. And... I mean, they were stunned. And it's like, well, how could you say that? And I said, well, I have freedom of speech. You know, you may not like what I have to say, but I'm allowed to say it anyway. And by the same token, I have a right to self-defense. I have a right to keep and bear arms. You may not like it. You may It might make you nervous. You may toss and turn all night too damn bad. It's a personal problem, and I think you should get over it. Exactly. And, you know, exactly following what you're saying, I completely feel on the same page on this one, so much that a uh, few months ago, when the Congress was trying to pass this sort of a gun registration or some sort of gun uh, legislation for gun control, whatever, I talked to myself for a while, because it is a serious matter for me. You know, I came here and I worked very hard the last uh, almost 16 years to try to accomplish something that many people, you know, they, you know, it's, let's put it this way, we have a lot to lose. You know, we work, we save, you know, and uh, like our founding fathers, they had so much to lose and some of them, they lost so much. But the bottom line was their freedom, their principle were more important than wealth more important in their lives. And I came to this conclusion after probably thinking about myself uh, for about a few days, because what I'm going to say right now to the audience, I already said once, it is not something that uh, it is just saying for show purposes. I really mean it. And I have God in front of me. I also I would like to have uh, all the audience and Michael Badnarik in front of me. This is my pledge to America and to my fellow Americans by Gianluca Zanna. And today is uh, February the 9th, 2014. I, Gianluca Zanna, former legal immigrant from Rome, Italy, naturalized American and proud citizen of the state of Arizona, a law-abiding citizen till the laws are just and within the boundaries of the United States Constitution and Bill of Rights, a peaceful and not violent man until illegal violence will be used against my persona and my fellow Americans. I stand in front of God as my witness. I pledge my life, my wealth, and my honor that I will never comply to any gun confiscation. I will never surrender any of my guns, rifles, or weapons guaranteed by the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution and by the Arizona Constitution to any federal, state, local, or foreign agency that will try to enforce any unconstitutional, illegal act with the purpose to deny me of my God-given right of self-defense for my persona and my liberty. I'm aware of the risk I may incur for my life because of this decision. I understand that the odds to survive any act of non-compliance are against me. I'm not fool. I understand that. And this is a serious matter, but so is my dignity, my liberty as American, and my Second Amendment. In case of gun confiscation, not only I will not comply with it, hope you're listening, NSA, okay? 
but I intentionally will refuse to hide or separate my persona from my guns. I'm not going to put my guns on the ground. Maybe few, but I'm going to carry with me. And I will bear them as I normally do every day in my life in the great state of Arizona. So I ask God for courage, strength, and resolution to uphold my oath. I ask my fellow Americans to join me in standing together for our freedom, for our state rights, and a defense of our constitutional republic. So help me God, Gianluca Zanna. Thank you very much. This is just to show that it's up to us, as you say in your book, if every one of us, it's 300 millions of us, like you say in your book, uh, Secret to Sovereignty, you do the example with the Chinese, you know, the Chinese people oppressed, 1.5 billion people against 3,000 little tyrants, you know, we have more power than we can see. Don't you agree with me, Mike? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I have so much respect for you and the oath that you just made to your, uh, your listeners. And, and let me swear to you that if I have the opportunity, I will be there to help defend your life, your person, your property. And I will proudly stand and dedicate my life my fortune, my sacred honor, to not only your liberty, but to the liberty of all of our fellow Americans and to all of our fellow humans around the world who live in oppressive dictatorships. They may not understand the principles, but they are a part of my human family and your human family. And as soon as I possibly can, I am working to spread freedom around the world to to anybody regardless what language they speak where they happen to be born um i have this dream of a world full of peace i agree because you know it's contagious you know it's a good thing freedom is contagious and uh, i think the best way we can do to try to spread this uh virus of, of freedom is to show by example because you know I always laugh at uh, the propaganda media when they say oh we gotta go there so we can uh, spread democracy the best way we can spread freedom first of all not democracy that's a very dangerous thing to, sp- to spread is by example if we can show that in our land where we are here that our founders left us we can live a life as free human beings and then other countries would like to feel like almost a sense of jealousy to, to, to imitate us, to, 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 to get there. But I like the idea, yeah, we all connect, especially now. You realize that uh, this global government, that you're very aware of that, I know that, is trying to pretty much enslave us all, the rest of the world. I see America, it's almost the last place. They're still fighting back, hopefully more, but they, it's the last bastion of us, whatever it's left of this little fire of freedom. Don't you agree with me? That's why they need to knock us down. Of, of course. And it is that spirit of freedom that is impossible to quench. The only way that you can eliminate that spirit of freedom is to kill the person who has it. And I talk about Patrick Henry, who's uh, one of our famous founding fathers. Most people know little or nothing about Patrick Henry. The only thing, the only thing that most Americans know is give me liberty or give me death. Really, that's it? That's just those seven words and that's all you remember. So let's focus on what that really means. Patrick Henry understood that there are three possible conditions in your life. First of all, you can live in freedom. Second, you can fight and possibly die fighting for your freedom. Or you can give up and live as a slave. Exactly. Well, as far as Patrick Henry and Lucasana and Michael Badnarkin are concerned, slavery is not an option. I will never be a slave for anybody. So if we take slavery off the table... What you're left with is liberty or death. And my follow-up question to the audience would be, do you think that the United States government is allowing you to live in liberty? And we've got the NSA listening to our phone calls, reading all of our email, 
We've got the IRS taking 50% of everything that we make each year. We've got the Department of Motor Vehicles requiring you to, you know, register your vehicle. You can't get on an airplane without the blessing of the, you know, um, Sex Federal aviation, uh, aviation Administration. I mean, everything that we do in our lives is controlled by a government agency. And so the answer is no, we are not living in liberty. Well, if you take liberty off the table, there is only one choice left, and that is to fight and possibly die fighting for that freedom. I agree. That, that's what the Founding Fathers meant when they dedicated their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. They were all in. Either, you know, we are going to win this, or we're going to die trying. I agree, Michael. And, you know, I really must tell you honestly, when I left Italy, I had no idea exactly what I was going to, destiny, what it was going to bring me in, because, you know, I had, a, like an immigrant, some sort of uh, born and raised in uh, Little Anzio, it's World War II landing place. You know, I have a lot of respect for the people that die on the beaches of Anzio, American soldiers. So I have no idea though the dangers or also America I was transformed. But as I learned fast, you know, I tried to learn as much as I could. It's always a process, of course, still learning. But then I start to realize that really this is now up to us. We are the people that we, are, we need to stand the line because if we fail now, whoever coming after us, going to be nothing left. So that's why I, for me, citizenship, or even just to become part of this uh, idea of freedom, that's more important than everything else, try to, 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 to protect the, 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 the sacrifices of people before us did for us, it's something serious. It's like I almost feel uh, the sensation, like our founding had to go through. Well, you jump into a dark room, the door behind you lock. And you, don't, you know that you're not going to be able to find the exit until you succeed. Because once you jump into the dark room, like you, you, do, you, you, you took your decision, that's not a game. You know that you're going to gasp for air, and the only way you're going to get air back is when you win or when you're gone to another level. So I have a, a song. I know that you don't like uh, to listen to music, but I'm trying also here as a free market sell music because that's what I do for a living. And my audience has been very nice supporting the show. They can go to my website, loveguntsandfreedom.com, loveguntsfreedom.com. I have a new CD that is called Love, Guns and Freedom. And uh, it is a track number two. It's called The Line in the Sand. And uh, just listen maybe to the lyrics because even if you're not into music, I really had the inspiration in writing this song uh, because of people like you, Michael, okay? I, I'm going to go right now with The Line in the Sand, Lyrics and Music by Lucas Zen. Contest of freedom. Go from us in peace. We ask not your counsels or arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains sit lightly upon you. And may posterity forget that you were our countrymen. The line in the sand, you know the time is coming. The line in the sand, are you going to watch while we're fighting? The line in the sand, just tell me now where you're going to stand. How much more are you gonna take it? How much more are you gonna fake it? Now you decide what you'll do when they come. They'll come for you. You see things I 
Line in the Sand, lyrics and music by Gianluca Zanna. Michael, are you still there? I'm here. And uh, thank you for listening, Michael. And uh, we are here. I'm, I must tell you today I'm very emotional. I mean, a good way because uh, one of the reasons why my instinct brought me to this country was because of people like you, okay? Before even I knew you existed. You know, I idolize America and the idea of liberty, of rights, something completely that you don't have in, in Europe, in Italy, you have privileges, you're subject in everything you do, you're just a worker. So, and finally, when I found you and other people like you, I found, I found my fellow men, I found my fellow brothers and sisters that we believe in this idea that is real, it's not just an idea of be free men, or at least trying to be free. So I really appreciate to be here with me. I'm really excited about it. Thank you again. Well, again, I am honored to, to be here with you. I appreciate so much the fact that you are passionate about these ideals. And even though you and I were born thousands of miles apart, we are brothers. I agree. And, and I'm very sincere about my, my willingness to, to help you if the, the government ever comes to try to violate your rights. And, and that's what we should do, understand from each other, because I'm trying to talk with my fellow neighbors, you know, and I always, uh, when I, we've been trained to just uh, be isolated, to just look at ourselves, be selfish, because something happening to somebody else, oh, must be a good reason, it's not me, just shut up, look down. And that's the way the enforcers, that's the way the tyrants work. There is a video that I would like everybody should watch. It's on YouTube. It's about the water buffaloes and the five or six little lions. Did you ever watch that, Michael? Oh, I have seen that. That's yeah. very good. It's very powerful. It says it all. You see thousands of powerful uh, water buffaloes minding their business, eating, drinking at the river. And then you see, you know, the tyrants, or at least the people that would like to uh, abuse somebody else, in this case, the lions. By the way, they're much more respectful than governments, at least lions. They have a purpose to exist. They're doing the lion's job. Governments, they're just parasite, in my opinion, at least most of it. But regardless, the idea is that five, six little lions, they, got, they jump on the small, little, weak uh, water buffalo that is pretty much by himself defenseless. For a moment, the big pack of uh, water buffaloes, they just they got afraid and they run. Guess what? Better than humans, then they realize their number, their power, and they cannot leave behind a fellow buffalo. It's like almost a cartoon. I couldn't believe it. You start to see the big pack of thousand buffaloes understanding the power that they have and uh, they completely liberate, free the poor little buffalo that was almost going to become lunch or dinner for the lions. And that's the idea, that if we get together, we understand that it's not just about us, but it's about we the people and our idea of freedom, we can, nobody can stop us. We can regain our freedom today, right now. I mean, do you hear in Connecticut, uh, the government tried to enforce this uh, gun registration. It seems like only 5% uh, comply with that. Hey, Michael? Hey, I'm here. I... Yeah, did you hear Connecticut tried to enforce this gun registration and it seemed like that they could not make it so far? Well, I'd like your listeners to, you know, think back to the American Revolution when the Founding Fathers were preparing to sign the Declaration of Independence. In January of 1776, just, I mean, less than a year before the Declaration was signed, most of the Founding Fathers were afraid. They had no desire to fight against King George. King George has the most powerful army and navy in the world. You know, we'll be slaughtered, it'll be terrible. 
and you know nobody wanted to do it well within six months for some reason or other the uh, the founding fathers found the the courage to to stand up against the tyrant and even though the british army was better trained it was far larger than the the continental army the the founding fathers and the the americans the colonists we won we we established our freedom because of that innate spirit that that solid belief that unwillingness to give up michael i'm going to keep you for the second hour you please hold your thought okay i'll be here thank you okay stay tuned love guns and freedom with we'll lucas zan and michael badnarik on k talks 1340 a.m Don't go away. Much more coming. He's a songwriter, a poet, a rifleman. I'm not afraid. And a constitutional activist. I'm not afraid. Italian by birth. I'm not afraid. American by choice. Gianluca Zana. I'm not afraid. And his new CD, Love. Guns and Freedom, 16 powerful songs on one CD from the heart of a patriot. For download or to order the CD, go to www.lovegunsfreedom.com. That's www.lovegunsfreedom.com. Lyrics for your mind, music for your heart. Gianluca Zana's new CD, Love, Guns, and Freedom. You're listening to KTOX 1340 AM, Needles, California. Visit NP Gunsmith and Sales at 4470 Highway 95, Suite 13 at Camp Mojave Road in Fort Mojave. If you're looking for a special gun, accessory, or shooter's gift, NP Gun Sales blows the competition out of the water. Automatics, revolvers, ammo, archery supplies, knives, and valuable advice from our knowledgeable weapons masters make NP Gunsmith and Sales the shooter's paradise. Stop by or call us at 928-444-5905. This portion of Love, Guns, and Freedom is brought to you by Colorado River Vapor. The best place for a smoking alternative is Colorado River Vapor in Fort Mojave. Vapor is all the rage, and Colorado River Vapor has it all covered. They have a learning center for one-on-one -on -one instruction, and they'll customize a kit for your individual needs. There are over 180 flavors of e-juice to choose from in any nicotine level. There are two e-juice bars where you can try your flavors before you purchase. Colorado River Vapor has a wide variety of all the latest vapor accessories. Come in and meet our professional staff and enjoy the relaxing atmosphere and conversation. Ditch the tar and trash the ash and catch the wave and vape at Colorado River Vapor, located at 4400 South Highway 95 in Fort Mojave. Uh, back on the air, this is Luca Zanna, Love, Guns and Freedom, special guest today, Michael Badnerik. Michael, are you still there? I'm here. Listen, I more I read your book, the more I think this is uh, revolutionary as much. You know, I like simple things because sometimes we all think, you know, we want to find the most difficult solution. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes we have it in front of us, like the idea of the water buffaloes, you know, and this uh, book, Secret to Sovereignty, I found uh, revolutionary in a positive way and in a constructive way. And I wish every American or everybody that believes in freedom would get it and maybe just find their own conclusion. How can people get your book? How can they can order your book? I know you have a different way of trading. Right. I, my website is Constitution Preservation. Dot org. And I've written two books. The first one is called Good to be King, that describes the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The second book is Secret to Sovereignty, and you can read excerpts of my books. You can download Chapter 2 of 
Good to Be King, which is entitled Rights Versus Privileges. And then I have uh, basically a sample of the information in Secret to Sovereignty. That way you can get a flavor of what the book is about before you decide to spend money on it. Um, however, the uh, Secret to Sovereignty book, I only barter with that. If you want a copy of my book, I'm not going to accept Monopoly money because Monopoly money is worthless paper. I'm not going to accept Confederate money, you know, for the same reason. It's worthless paper. And similarly, I do not accept Federal Reserve notes for my second book because they're worthless pieces of paper that the government has printed out of thin air. And so... Basically, if you want a copy of my book, you're going to have to trade an ounce of silver uh, or call me and negotiate some other item of value, and then I'll send you my book. But a lot of people are not willing to go through the trouble of getting the silver, and they, they find that that's you know, just too much trouble. And... Unfortunately, if you think it's too much trouble to go and get an ounce of silver, you're going to find the answers in my book too much trouble. You're not going to want those answers anyway. So it just kind of saves you some time, saves me some time. Uh, the, the first book, Good to be King, is pretty much for everybody. It's a very simple explanation of the principles uh, that we can find in the Constitution. And Secret to Sovereignty is a little bit more radical. Radical. Um, it, it's down to earth. The, the bottom line is that you're never going to change the government. The government is just too big. There's too much corruption. And, I mean, you're pushing a big rock up a steep hill. So instead of wasting your time trying to change the government... I have some ideas and concepts where you can change yourself. I mean, not in a bad way. You know, if you're overweight and I say, well, you need to get on a diet, you need to do a little bit of exercise, that's going to change your daily lifestyle. But if you want to be healthy, if you want to feel really good, it's for your own benefit. Um, you know, some of the things in my book are going to be difficult for people to do. Um, I mean, not physically, like, you know, go outside and lift 200 pounds. The th reason that my book may be difficult for some people is that it requires you to change the way that you think. It, it requires you to question some of the conclusions that you've adopted. And, and that's really hard for some people to do. They, it, it's like, my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the fact. And so unless you're willing to analyze the world around you and investigate your own set of principles and be willing to change them for your own benefit, then, you know, don't waste the time. But, you know, if like Luca, if like me, you, you have this burning passion for freedom, you know that things are not right in the United States, you want to live in a better country, then, then get my book, um, and I'd be more than happy to answer questions and help you out. And but it's it's up to each of us individually. This is not something where you just vote for some guy that you never met before, and he's going to solve the problem for you. If I could, I could add, Michael. You know, this is my personal experience. Of course, everybody's different. Uh, my experience with Michael's book. First of all, I was able to buy on Amazon Good to be King a long time ago. And it really helped me out a lot to learn, uh, to understand better and deeper the Constitution and Bill of Rights. It was, you know, as you say, if you don't know your rights, you have no rights. So that, I think it would be the first step really to have Good to be King. And then at the same time, it's complementary. Secret to sovereignty is almost like the solution, at least your personal solution that every one of us must find out, nobody else. And I, I like, I really thank you for the beautiful dedication you put in the book. 
uh, to Gianluca, sovereignty is a gift that you give yourself. I mean, that's very profound. It's it pretty much the essence of the book. It's here. You know, if we cannot change the world unless we change the way we look at the world, the way we interact with the world. If we're going always to be a train or to act like victims, like uh, sheep, like cows, like cattle, how can we pretend that we have rights? The moment that we, and this is for me, the way it worked out, when a few years ago I started to have the enlightenment, to say, hey, I don't care what you do to me, I am free. And the point is, the moment that we say no, and we automatically, even just a civil disobedience, I'm not trying to say here to, to get violent, to do anything bad, just say no, this is wrong, I have rights, I'm not going to submit to you. Let me see, somebody's calling, let's see. Caller, are you on the air? Yes. Who is calling there? Where are you? My name is Greg. I live in uh, uh, Richmond, Ohio. Nice to meet you, Greg. How did you find about the show? Uh, Michael sent me an email. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Have any questions for Michael or for any of us? Uh, yeah, for Michael. Uh, basically, uh, it's actually a, um, a statement. Let's put it this way. Uh, we don't have... Uh, we need to change the concept of rights. We don't have a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Uh, this is something that the Congress is supposed to swear no to. Uh, our rights come from God. They don't come from the Constitution, and we have to change that mindset. Uh, if we think that our rights come from the Constitution, that means that sooner or later, you know, like what they're trying to do now with having a constitutional convention, that's going to all change. But if our rights come from God, you can't change that. That is that's inherent upon every human being. Uh, no matter where you're from, uh, you can come here from any part, any part of the globe, and you still have that right here. You have the right of speech. You have the right, uh, right to protect yourself. Uh, and our government is, is putting it into our mind that we have rights guaranteed by the Constitution, but if the Constitution disappears, where do our co uh, rights go? Right out the window. But if we understand that they come from God, they can't take nothing away from us, and we have to protect them like that. The other point is, is that we need to start to sit back and remember that we have to protect each other. We can't sit back and just think about me, myself, and I. Exactly. We have to sit back and think like the Founding Fathers did. We're going to you know, protect each other within our community, within our state. Uh, that, that was the whole concept of uh, the, the Revolutionary War, is to, is to protect the entire state and this country from a foreign invader, King George. Thank you, Colin. I really appreciate your call. And Michael, hey, since... Michael, hello, and take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, just since the man uh, brought up uh, this, uh, you know, there is a big talk right now about this uh, Article 5 Constitutional Convention, and uh, what is your position on that? I think that uh, Article 5 Convention opens up the Constitution to massive changes. And the problem with that is that the people who will be doing the changes are not looking out for our best interests. They are planning to subvert the Constitution. Now, I admit that there are things that are in the Constitution that are mistakes. Um, slavery was protected until uh, 1808. And I think that it's pretty clear to say that Slavery is a bad thing. But if we had people who understood the concept of rights and privileges, understood that the only valid purpose of the government was to defend the life, liberty, and private property of the citizens, then an Article Five convention wouldn't scare me because I knew that we would go in and fix the things that are wrong in the Constitution. But at the moment, at the moment, with all the corruption in Washington, D.C., all the corruption being foisted upon us by the United Nations, opening up the Constitution to massive changes at a time like this is basically throwing 
what little protection of our rights we have, uh, just throwing it away. I agree. And also, you know, I would like to remind to the fellow patriots that they're trying to push uh, for this uh, constitutional convention and, you know, they read their book. I know there is a book out there from a famous uh, broadcaster. First of all, guys, I have two logics here I use, okay? Even with my accent, uh, with my, I didn't go to school, I just learned pretty much reading books. Number one, do you see any type of uh, moral statue of uh, human beings like in our, between our statesmen, uh, like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, even Mr. Adams? I mean, you see the average scumbag that we have in Washington is uh, no worth two cents, okay, seriously. And this is not trying to be, I mean, besides few exceptions, we really don't have any more the moral uh, depth of type of politicians that we had in the past between our, among our framers. Even they were imperfect, but we have completely different type of humanity right now, number one. So are we going to entrust this type of new type of statement to rewrite a document that even completely with their flaws, you know, its flaws, still was the best thing a human uh, society and civilization had in pro probably about 5,000 years of history. Number one. Number two, you can write now everything you want. What type of special magic ink are you going to use that now finally the politicians elected, that they've already been proven to completely act of treasons, to completely disregard their out of office? What, why now you think if you rewrite it in a better language, they're going to enforce it or they're going to uphold it. That's the thing that really made me understand that it makes no sense. And more important, you open Pandora's vase. Once you open the vase, they can legally, according because you must uphold the Constitution, we're going to be completely enslaved according to the Constitution. So my allegiance at the end of the day is not the Constitution, it's not the Bill of Rights like the man was calling right now. It's about the principle of freedom and natural rights that they are enumerated in the Constitution, but as you say, Mike, in your uh, different uh, um, seminars, the Constitution doesn't give me rights. So the Bill of Rights, I have rights the moment I was born. Correct, Mike? Oh, correct. Absolutely. And I tell my students in class, and they're usually surprised, if you want to burn the Constitution, if you want to shred the Bill of Rights, I really don't care, because it's not going to change any of my rights. I had those rights in spite of the Constitution, not because of the Constitution. Completely. And uh, so thank you, caller. And there are good points. And I like the final point. We need to start to think it's not just about me, me and me. It's about uh, um, us as much as I believe in the individual. When it comes down to defending each other, people that believe in the same. First of all, I believe in the innocence. Even if I don't agree with you, I always would put my life in front of you, and that's my personal choice I took. But more important, we have now brothers and sisters that are not even connected by blood, but just the idea of freedom and the same type of ideals that our founding fathers had. I feel that we have the obligation to look for each other. And I give you some ideas. You know, I know, Michael, you mentioned several parts of your books, some scenarios. You know, there are, for example, the beginning of your book, you say, if people, you believe that you're supposed to follow uh, the orders from the government, that you cannot uh, drink raw milk, okay? Or you pretty much you will go along uh, with somebody trying to put a microchip in your, uh, your body. Or somebody is going to force a vaccine on you. <sighs> this book is not for you. And I agree. I agree. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your money. Give the chance to somebody else to read it. But somebody that decides that that's your line in the sand, I feel the obligation. For example, I have no kids, okay? But if I knew that some of my neighbors had a visit from some sort of a force. Now, for example, in New York, I don't know if you heard that, Mike, that the city of New York made mandatory uh, vaccination for, uh, I think, the flu shot the, the, for all the uh, children. Every child in New York must take the flu shot mandatory. And uh, it's not that tyranny, Mike. What do you think about that? Um, when I decided to run for president, they wanted to organize a small press conference for me, just maybe a dozen people, just something for me to practice, you know, for me to get my political feet wet, as it were. And I, the very first question at my very first press conference was, Mr. Badnarik, what is your point of view on mandatory vaccinations? 
unfortunately, I hadn't practiced, you know, being a diplomat yet. <laughs> I didn't know how to answer a question without pissing people off. And so under moments of stress, the problem with an engineer is they blurt out the truth. And my answer was, you bring the syringe, I'll bring my 45, and we'll see who makes a bigger hole. And I completely agree with you, by the way. I remember and, that. Yeah, and I, I got a one-page article in the San Antonio newspaper because of that. And it is probably the one thing, the one quote that I am most famous for. Yes, and I saw also your a phrase on uh, the documentary, Don't Tread on Me, that uh, you were featured there. I, I'm sure you remember that. You remember the documentary, Don't Tread on Me? You were one of the guests. It's a, I... I'll be real honest with you. I don't remember many of the... <laughs> okay, but you were there, and uh, I remember that phrase was there. Great. Listen, Michael, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, philosophy, uh, concept of freedom, role of government, and uh, now I would like to go back one second on uh, something very unique that if you want, you can, you know, answer. It's something more personal that I think is connected also for what we are, what you are. You know, I know that you had a, a near-death experience. Uh, you suffered of a heavy heart attack. Uh, it was December the 21st, 2009, while you were in uh, Wisconsin. You were attending a hearing regarding a raw milk case. And they tried to, your friends, they tried, attempted to give you a CPR for three times. And you were pretty much gone at the time. And only the fourth time, you came back among us. Uh, the question is, did your near to that experience change your perspective on life and also about your activism? Um, interestingly enough, no, that that experience did not change my perspective on life. I have been a skydiver and a skydiving instructor, and we know that life is short. We know that if we don't pull the ripcord at the right time, we're going to die. And so skydivers tend to live, you know, 100%. We grab for all the gusto that we can. We don't jump out of perfectly good airplanes because we're trying to commit suicide. We jump out of perfectly good airplanes because we know that life is short and we are trying to enjoy it as much as possible while we are still here. So for me, nothing happened. I remember waking up in the morning. I remember taking a shower and getting packed. But I don't remember my friend picking me up. I don't remember a five-hour ride to Wisconsin. I don't remember reading his little girl a bedtime story. I don't remember giving my speech on the steps in front of the uh, courthouse. All I remember is that I woke up in a hospital bed And my best friend was standing there. And my best friend says, do you know who you are? And I said, well, that's rather condescending. Eh, of course I know who I am. <laughs> you know, it's a silly question. And he says, do you know what day it is? And I stopped and I thought about it. And I, I knew that I had I'd given a speech on December 21st. And so I thought maybe it's December 22nd, December 23rd. I don't know. What day is it? He says, it is January 6th. Wow. I had slept through Christmas. I had slept through, um, you know, New Year's. And basically I was in a, a drug-induced coma. Wow. And the reason for that is that your brain requires a certain amount of oxygen. The brain is the most uh, sensitive organ that we have, and it's one of the first to die if we, if we don't get the oxygen that we need. And so if they allow me to stay conscious, then my arms and legs and my body are using up oxygen that is now going to be deprived to my brain. By keeping me in a state of suspended animation, as it were, all the oxygen in my blood can be used to keep my brain alive. Yes. And, and so they were concerned about brain damage. They warned my parents 
that I may not live. If I did live, it was very likely that I would require a walker the rest of my life. And and so my, my parents and my family were naturally very, very disturbed. And the doctors are unable to explain why I eventually woke up and walked out of the hospital under my own power. Wow. And, and I think it's because they don't have a medical test for stubborn. <laughs> I agree. I am one of the most stubborn people that you will ever meet. I can uh, read. I can I'm read. not going quietly. I, I, uh, I, I can see through your books, through your readings, and, uh, and I'm glad you are with us because we need you. We need your, your experience. You need, we, need, we need each other. And, uh, you know, I think this is a journey, at least uh, for me it's a journey. I'm learning. I'm trying to learn as much as I can. And I'll tell you something. Last night, you know, even I was sick, I had some flu, and I apologized to my fellow uh, friends. And, you know, we wanted to go shoot yesterday. Normally I like to go shoot with my, uh, my listeners. And uh, I've been kind of under the weather. But, you know, meanwhile I was trying to relax and feel better for today. I was reading Secret to Sovereignty, and I came out with a phrase that is nothing profound, but for me it's something that really was the conclusion of uh, reading part of this book and my journey going around the world before I approached and finally I landed to America over 16 years ago. Freedom is not a place or a country, but a state of mind. If I, you don't stand for your rights, it does not matter where you are. And... Uh, Yesterday really came clear to my mind. You know, I've been looking for the island of freedom since I was probably 16. I was just dreaming about freedom, and I traveled around the world. I went to exotic islands when I was in my early 20s, and I realized that freedom is not a place. It's a state of mind. You must stand for your rights no matter where you are. And that I think secret to sovereignty, it would give you some great elements to find better answer to your journey. So thank you again, Mike. That was incredible. You know, and I'm still going through the book probably two more times at least because there's so much to assimilate, you know. Well, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. So, listen, I have other questions, and I will, I'm happy we can be together because uh, I consider this is not just a show. I consider, like, material information that people can listen to the show. I will put it on YouTube, and they can listen for free ever and ever and share it with friends because, as we say... Uh, if we have no right, if we don't know that we have rights, we cannot defend our rights. So first of all, we need to understand what's going on. And then when we apply this concept of freedom, we can apply to everything, to property rights, to gun rights, to everything in our life, you know. So uh, now I would like to have a couple extra questions. First of all, um, let's see one second. Education, okay? Uh, I know how you think about it, the Department of Education, uh, but maybe the listeners, they don't know. And my question is, first of all, let me read a phrase that you wrote. When the state or federal government control the education of all our children, they have the dangerous and illegitimate monopoly to control and influence the thought process of our citizens. Did you write that, Michael Batnarik? Um, I, if I didn't write it, I certainly hope that I wrote it. Perfect. I think it's yours. I found it on several websites, at least supposed to be yours. Okay, Michael Badnari, what is your uh, position on Common Core, and more important, on this Department of Education, and more important, how would you, uh, what would be your solution to the challenge of education for our students? When I teach my class, uh, and if they start to understand what a right is, they also learn that a right is equivalent to a responsibility. Rights and responsibilities are like opposite sides of a coin, heads and tails. I can give you heads and tails, but I can't give, give you one and keep the other one for myself. So you have either rights and responsibilities, or you have nothing. I mean, there, there's no middle ground. So, we, I have a right to keep and bear arms, but I have a responsibility not to hurt anybody with my gun. I have a, um, a right to life, but I have a responsibility to put food down my throat. If I don't eat, 
for a long enough period of time, I'm not going to be alive, and that's nobody's fault but mine. So when I ask people, what is the most important thing in your life? Frequently, they will say, oh, my children. I love my children. They're the most important thing. And then mom and dad send their children to a government-controlled school, and the teachers and the government are going to teach their children reading, writing, and arithmetic, or at least that's the idea. And then we have children coming out of high school who are functionally illiterate. And as you said before, I'm not trying to be nasty. I mean, these children can't read and write. They, they, don't, they don't know enough to really operate a paper route. And the parents will have the audacity to complain that, oh my gosh, my children didn't learn the skills and values that I wanted them to learn. And I said, well, why not? And the answer is because you didn't take the responsibility to teach your children. Mom and dad are responsible for feeding the children. Mom and dad are responsible for sheltering and protecting the children. And mom and dad are also responsible for teaching the children all the skills and values they need in order to become functional adults. And if you abdicate that responsibility, um, you really have no right to complain to the person that you gave the responsibility to. You know, who's responsible for putting food down your throat? You are. Who's responsible for putting shelter over your head? You are. Who's responsible for saving for your retirement? Well, you are. And if you are stupid enough to give all your Social Security money to the government <laughs> because you think the government is bigger and smarter and stronger than you are, <coughs> you have no right to complain when there's no food and there's no Social Security. I don't know anybody who is on Social Security who feels secure. Michael, so, what don't you think also the state, I mean, before the federal the creation of the Department of Education, how the United States, they had the best education. I remember in your uh, seminar, you state <laughs> that we had number one education before 1952, I guess. Uh, our students they were number one in the world. Then the creation of the Department of Education, we are now number 20, 20-something. I mean, we are pretty much coming down to the bottom. Uh, before, who was in charge? Was the state, correct? No, it was the individual parents. Really? Okay. So oh, yeah, the parents are responsible. Now, schools were all private. Okay. You know, you'd, you'd set up a building, you'd hire the teachers, okay. and people would send their children to that school because it had a reputation for being a good school. Now, was it a good school? because they were allowed to throw paper airplanes in class and laugh and joke and spend all their time at recess? What were the good schools? Well, the good schools were the ones that gave you extra homework. The good schools were the ones that were really, really hard. And, you know, if you were lucky enough to graduate from the hard school, well, then you could brag that you have a diploma from, you know, this prestigious university, it actually meant something. Michael, I would like to ask, you know, I'll try to also be a little bit the devil's advocate here. Um, for example, first of all, when was uh, these property taxes that now we are so used and think that is something normal to pay, most of the money goes to um, education, supposedly, local school, uh, besides fire department and other things. Uh, when was really... I mean, before 1950, we still were paying for property taxes, correct? Um, yeah, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, so this money was still used partially for public education that, correct me if I'm wrong, was mostly administered at state level, not at federal level, correct? Well, it started out at the state level, yeah. Yes. Okay, so there was some sort of, uh, let's say, um, between uh, the, the individual... The, as you say, homeschooling is, would be the first solution for me, too. And then, of course, at least was confined to a state level 
but never federal. All this, the federalization, started officially to be created after the Department of Education, 1952, I guess, correct? Uh, yeah, something like that. So I'm trying to learn, because this is a point for me, what I like about the shows is not just about telling you or getting the opportunity to know the, our guests, but it's a good opportunity for me to learn more what's exactly going on here. And, uh, for example, one thing I find really, um, you know, socialist and uh, violence on us, people complain about Obamacare, I well do, um, but let's think about for a moment. We've been forced to pay for a product that we don't use before, way before the Obamacare. I mean, I have property and uh, I have no choice. I have to pay the rent to uh, the king, in this case, the, the state or the county, property taxes, and part of this money, I am forced to pay this money for a school district that technically I don't use. So I'm still, I'm already being forced to pay for a product against my consent. So all the people that they're so disgusted about Obamacare, and I completely agree with them, before, it didn't happen overnight. This is not the first time. Our property taxes that we are forced to pay, we're already forcing to pay for a product that we may not use or need. So that's pretty much the only thing I wanted to remind to people. Michael, you think we're already a communist country because I read on your book, you have a secret to sovereignty that you prove that pretty much the communist manifesto uh, is live and well in uh, America already. Yes, it is. And again, that's, that's not an answer that many people want to hear. But, but you, have, you have facts. You know, it's not just your opinion. You have fa yeah. facts. Give us three facts, the three biggest things that people must understand while we are already a communist country. The, um, the, there are ten planks to the Communist Manifesto. We got the um, ten commandments, we got the ten Bill of Rights, and they also have the ten planks to the Communist Manifesto. And Number one is the abolition of private property. Well, once you understand that all of our rights are directly tied to private property, then you're going to know that you know anything that's going to abolish private property is also, by definition, going to you know abolish your rights. And so the Constitution and communism are mutually exclusive. You cannot have both of them. You can have one or the other. You either have private property or you don't. Now, 2 through 10 in the Communist Manifesto explain the steps to take your property away. Uh, number 2 is a heavy progressive income tax. A progressive income tax means... The more money you make, the more money they're going to take. Well, that makes perfectly good sense because if you have no money, they can't take it from you. They can't, even the government cannot take what you don't have. So the concept is that the rich people are going to pay for the poor people. And that's exactly what the uh, problem is with Obamacare. They continue to tell us that um, Obamacare is not working the way they want it to because young people are not signing up. Well, young people don't need health care as much as old people. And so basically the idea is that we want lots and lots of young people to sign up for, you know, Obamacare so that they can pay money now so that the government can afford to take care of the old people. So you're paying for somebody else's health care. Um, the f number five on the Communist Manifesto is a, um, a central bank. Exactly. In the United States, we recognize that as the Federal Reserve. Private Federal Reserve. Uh, the private Federal Reserve. It, you know, Federal Express is not part of the government, and the Federal Reserve... Reserve system is not a part of the government. That's that's a big surprise to many many people. Um, number ten, which I think is the most important, the most dangerous, is the uh, the fact that we want government control of schools. That's in the Communist Manifesto. Exactly. Well, I don't know why why would it be important to the communists? 
to, to have government control of schools. Why would that be necessary? Well, if the government comes to take property from Michael Badnark or Luca Zana, we're old enough to go, no, no, you're not going to take my property, and, you know, Luca and I are going to shoot back. <laughs> and the people trying to steal from us are going to get hurt. Now, on the other hand, if you can teach the children and brainwash them into thinking that you're always supposed to listen to the government. Anytime the teacher tells you what to do, anytime the police officer tells you what to do, anytime somebody in authority tells you what to do, you just have to do whatever they tell you to do. The schools are not to, there to teach any useful information. The schools are there to indoctrinate our children into being passive and submissive. I agree with you, Mike. And uh, my first experience when I was in Italy, that pretty much is uh, mandatory. You have not merely any type of rights when it comes down to uh, homeschooling. Uh, they try hard with me. They try hard. And trust me, uh, I don't know how, maybe it was in my DNA, I always re re uh, resist. Resist and even I realized the odds they were against me because I was surrounded by concepts that my instincts were telling me they were wrong. But I realized how easy it is to follow for it. You know, I realize, unfortunately, it's part of the plan to steal the next generation. So there is not really any type of uh, violence because they can pretty much just control the, the, the zombies the moment they were born. Mike, I have, uh, you know, so many things I would like to ask you, and this is already we're getting through the second hours. Uh, first of all, I have another question about pretty much the solution that I think you, we already talked a little bit about it's up to us. And uh, that's why I invite people reading the book, Secret to Sovereignty, because there is a lot of solution. But if we could condense one message for posterity, for the listeners now and the next future, today is uh, February the 9th, 2014. Michael, if you have one message to leave to our generation of people who believe in freedom and, and America, the idea Yupon was created, please tell me your message, the solution, the Michael Badnarik solution. Don't hurt me. Don't take my stuff or I'll shoot and kill you. Okay, that's interesting, a uh, very interesting message, simple but effective, I agree with you. Uh, we should not, we should respect each other, and uh, I always believe in the, the concept that uh, I have rights until I infringe on somebody else's rights, and uh, there is no reason why people should come and, you know, try to impose their will on me when I'm probably doing anything dangerous or bad to others, you know. Michael, another question also, uh, I already know, of course, the answer, but... I would like to share this information with uh, with the other fellow listeners. War on drug, a failure. I mean, we already know how many billions or trillions we spent the last 30 years. Uh, you write a phrase, on average, drug prisoners spend more time in federal prison than rapists, who often get out on early release because of the overcrowding in prison caused by the drug war. Uh, what is your solution, Michael, to stop this plague of drugs? Well... Again, it's education. You know, people are not going to fix something if they don't realize that it is a problem. So we have to have massive support for anything that's going to succeed. My question is, does the government have the authority to tell you what you can eat? No. I mean, you're an adult. You decide what food you eat. You decide what liquids you drink. Well, if you decide what liquids you drink, how did Congress pass the 18th Amendment, which established prohibition in the United States? How does the government, how does Congress get the authority to tell functional adults that they're not allowed to drink alcohol? Well, the answer to that is the government doesn't have that authority. The, the 18th Amendment was eventually replaced by the 21st Amendment, or repealed by the 21st Amendment, because the government found it difficult or impossible to put people in jail. People were being taken to court for selling alcohol during Prohibition. And a lot of times... They were, you know, sweet little old grandmothers who were simply trying to feed their 
children and grandchildren during the de Depression. And, you know, nobody wants to put Grandma in jail. I mean, she's just trying to do a good thing and, and feed her grandchildren. So the 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment because the government has no authority to tell you what you can or cannot drink. Exactly. Well, if prohibition of alcohol was a failure, and, you know, furthermore, the government had no legitimate authority, then where does the government get the authority to tell you that you're not allowed to take heroin, that you're not allowed to take cocaine? You know, it doesn't have that authority. I mean, you have, you. it is your body. Your body belongs to you. It is your property. It's the first property that you own. So if it is your body, you get to decide what you eat, what you drink, and what kind of chemicals you put inside, not the government. If the government is telling you what you can or cannot eat, then you're just a slave and, and maybe you're too stupid to know it. I agree. And I get so passionate, too, because I don't smoke. I don't like any type of drugs, natural or artificial. But I feel very uh, devastated to the idea that a mob or some sort of a lobbyist or just somebody in government can decide what I'm allowed to eat or drink or smoke. I mean, this is for me, uh, like I, you know, talking about the raw milk, I don't put any type of distinction between a raw milk or uh, smoking a plant. I mean, it's my body. The only concern should be that I do not infringe on other people's rights. And then, at that point, I should be able to smoke cyanide if I want to. It's my duty. I mean, it's my responsibility. But uh, I agree. And, uh, you know, I wish we had more time just to talk about this. Michael, I have, uh, I'm reading part of uh, the chapter that is called Grab Gold, Guns, and Groups. Chapter 10. I find it very interesting, practical, good information. Uh, you, you're very, you know, Mike, what's going on. And uh, we are living like a very specific time of American history. That now even the zombies, they start to smell that something's going on. But if, uh, according to your personal experience and the data that you have right now, what do you think is going to happen in the next 12 months? I think that the economy is going to be one of the first dominoes to fall. Um, Greece is already bankrupt. Two, two years ago, we were watching riots in Athens, Greece, because the Greek government ran out of money to give to the people. I mean, it was just a completely socialist state, and the people were, you know, saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. You know, and the, and the government was passing out all the money. Well, when the money ran out, that's why the people were rioting. Um, I think that Spain and Italy are pretty much bankrupt right now. Uh, Germany is the only country in Europe that is still solvent, and they have sworn that they are not going to be loaning money anymore to other countries that can't pay them back. Um, there are five countries that have formed a coalition known as BRICS, B-R-I-C-S. And that stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And those five countries have decided that they are going back to the gold standard, that they are only going to do national business in gold. Well, those countries have huge populations. Brazil, Russia, India, China... I think that's about two-thirds of the world's population right there. And if those countries go to the gold standard, it's not, it will not be possible for the United States economy to continue, at least not the way that it is at the moment. The Federal Reserve has been printing money like it's going out of style. That's one of the reasons that I won't accept Federal Reserve notes for my book, because they're just worthless pieces of paper. And I think that sometime in 2014, the people of the United States are going to realize that their, their foundation money is worthless, that there are going to be a run in the banks, the stock market is going to crash, that the shelves in the grocery stores are going to be empty. And even if you go to the grocery store with 
a thousand dollars. It's not going to buy anything. It, it maybe it'll get you a loaf of bread. Um, I recommend that people read about the Weimar Republic, yes, which was Germany between World War One and World War Two, and they were printing money so fast that there would be a price in the morning, a price in the afternoon, and another price at dinner time. That's how fast the economy was inflating and and how fast the prices were rising. And your listeners can go to my website, constitutionpreservation.org, and under um, media archive, there is a lesson in hyperinflation, and you can see photographs of German marks. One, five, ten, a thousand, ten thousand, okay, no problem. Fifty thousand, hundred thousand, a million. When you get down to the bottom, it's a billion marks. A thousand million marks in one piece of paper. So it's coming. I believe, unfortunately, the data and the charts, if people want to watch themselves, the charts from 1929 before the crash, where we are now, unfortunately, all the elements, the evidence is there. And uh, somebody else said, you know, you can ignore uh, reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences that reality will bring you. So be ready if you want to. It's up to you. And I really appreciate Michael to sharing this extra information. Michael, can I ask you, where are you located right now? Can you say which part of the world are you uh, calling us from? I'm, I'm in Indiana, not far from Chicago. So We you... have way too much snow, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, I'm uh, living here taking care of my parents. Um, once my parents are gone, I move back to Texas. You are a citizen of the from... Republic, uh, citizen of Texas, correct? I am a citizen of Texas. Perfect. Michael, I love you as a brother. And uh, I'm so proud today I've spent two hours with you. And it gave me a sense to be, to, to be here to me, for me, to be here broadcasting and try to explain myself to my fellow Americans. And because of people like you, I feel like really my life was worth it. Thank you very much, Michael. Well, thank you, Luca. And uh, we've never met face to face, but we are brothers in liberty. Yes, and I would like to say something. Uh, you still do these constitution classes? I mean, I know you're busy now. Okay, if people want to, uh, let's say, we, we can uh, ask you through the website. We can say your website, please, one more time. Constitutionpreservation.org. So we can contact you and we can ask you details if we can bring you out, can we bring you in our communities, correct? Absolutely, thank, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Stay tuned and uh, please be in touch, okay? Okay, I sure will. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, guys, this uh, was Lucas Zanna, Love, Guns, and Freedom. I'm so excited today we had Michael Badnarik. I would like to leave you today with one phrase come out to me in my mind yesterday, last night. I was listening about uh, this uh, Golden Valley Fire Department controversy going on. I would like just to say one thing, guys. People's apathy is the fertile ground for government corruption. Uh, we need to not be afraid to ask questions, and to get involved when it comes down to public business. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, and uh, see you next Sunday. We have a great guest next Sunday. Don't go away. We have Frontside Nevada, the general manager, Brad Hackman. Visit MP Gunsmith and Sales at 4470 Highway 95, Suite 13 at Camp Mojave Road in Fort Mojave. If you're looking for a special gun, accessory, or shooter's gift, NP Gun Sales blows the competition out of the water. Automatics, revolvers, ammo, archery supplies, knives, and valuable advice from our knowledgeable weapons masters make NP Gunsmith and Sales the shooter's paradise. Stop by or call us at 928-444-5905.